we have the shaping of something that is taking place and then the evolution of a global water justice movement which poses some real challenges to all of us and how we relate to it in the future. I want us to tell another story about this and that is, gets back to bottled water a little bit, <laughs> but uh, I can never stay away from bottled water, you know that. Uh, but it is the story of another part of the world, India. The story of Pachamata in India. Pachamata is a village of around 5,000 people in the state of Kerala. And about four years ago, a little over four years ago, the people in Pachamata realized that their water tables were dropping very rapidly. And that farmers were struggling to get enough water to grow their crops. And they were faced with huge problems in an already fairly dry and arid area regarding water conservation. When they probed this further, they realized, of course, that a, a new uh, plant, a state-of-the-art Coca-Cola plant had been put, put in the area and was taking a great deal of water from the, uh, from the groundwater system. And so they began to say, that Coca-Cola plant's got to shut down. It's destroying our livelihood. It's destroying our way of life. Our farmers can't grow their crops. Something's got to be done about this. And women led the way. It's a group of village women who said, let us follow our tradition, our Gandhian tradition. Let us exercise nonviolent uh, civil disobedience by shutting down the plant or making it impossible for them to make their, bring their trucks in and out. And so the women occupied the gate around the plant and created this massive sit down and, and, uh, and protest. And, making it difficult, if not impossible, for those trucks to go through. They started that, and they continued that protest day after day after day. And then about in January of 2005, I had the experience of being there, and it was the 1,000th day of protest and resistance. Imagine that, 1,000 days of resisting day after day to stop and to shut down that plant. They went through battles back and forth with the, uh, with the uh, local panchayat, the panchayat, which is the local government, and, and with the, 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 the high court system trying to move this agenda forward and get the stoppage uh, for, for the plant shut down. And, and they were successful up to a point, but what they did was their resistance day after day after day, which is still going on to this day in, in Pachamata. Now what's interesting about that story is that that sparked a whole series of protests throughout the entire country of India. Within several days after the Pachamata and the 1,000th day of resistance, there were resi uh, protests in 65 communities, cities and towns throughout India against either Coca-Cola or Pepsi-Cola. An incredible growth and mushrooming of resistance. Some of it had to do with the pesticides being used in, that, that became a part of the Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola products because of what they were doing to them. But part, big part of it, almost in every instance, the protest was against water takings. The water takings that were going on in the communities. In one community, one area, one, one small city, the plan the Pepsi-Cola plant was surrounded by a chain of 10,000 people linking arms. It was an incredible sight to see that. This is the kind of resistance that's building up. This is the kind of movement that we are a part of. And so in some ways, the story of Pachamada opens us up to other avenues, other parts of the water agenda. We've seen us move from the privatization of water services to starting to take on bottled water, which is, the, in my view, the cutting edge of privatization anyway. But it's broadening beyond that now. It's including peasants and including indigenous peoples. And we're seeing a broadening of this movement. And we've got to understand what that means and to take it into consideration and do something about it. And I think that these new dynamics that are emerging, 
between city and countryside, between urban and rural areas, are going to be dynamic, are going to be critical. Because the future of the city is being called into question. Very much so. How can we continue to build and, and to have these overcrowded cities and to build and put demands upon the water system? Here? And if we do, we're going to be reaching into the countryside and into the rural areas and stealing the water from their lands for these purposes. And there's going to be real struggle taking place as a result of it. So I think that these are challenges we are going to have to look at. And if we think that that's far off there, Think a little bit closer to home. I mean, New York City has been lucky to have had sources of water that it can draw upon. So is the city of Chicago. But if you look at New York City now, New York has to, is now having to, in its future planning, reach into the Adirondacks to get its water sources for the future. Because water sources are drying up. The city of Mexico, I know I'm taking this a little further away, is it's a dramatic case of this now because it, all of the water sources around the city of Mexico have almost dried up yet now. And so that they have to now pump in from 250 miles out and further out still. And as a result, the, the peasants cannot grow two crops a year. They're down to one crop a year as a result of that. These are the implications. We have got to rethink this, and we've got to broaden our thinking and our horizons with regards to the water movement. So I think that there are a number of challenges that are out there. Our definition of privatization should not and cannot be simply around the privatization of water services. It must also link to bottled water, but it must also go to the contamination of water systems that, are, that is taking place. It must reach out and we must deal with the bulk water transfers and exp exports that are taking place and the damming of rivers and lakes. That's all part of the building of this water movement. And we have brought, need to broaden our framework with regards to, the, what, to, to what we understand to be those water struggles. And I think that as we look at this and as we wrestle with these issues, we need to create events that will help us come together and to demonstrate our resistance collectively around the world. And there is something that's happening now that's being planned uh, by the, some of the groups that are engaged in the NGO processes anyway, of creating an, a, a, the month of October every year as, and designating it as Blue October. And the purpose for this is really to take one of those, those, those critical moments I talked about, one of those critical stories, namely the story of Uruguay, and the fact that it was in October that they won the plebiscite, that the, they won the plebiscite and won the constitutional referendum, or sorry, constitutional amendment. And uh, as a result of all of that, people feel that that is the moment to celebrate. And so let's take the moment, let's take uh, the month of October and to use that as a month in which a variety of activities that are occurring around water can be lifted up and so that we can link with one another around the world around that. It's the beginning, and they're beginning with it this year, Blue October. There are a number of events planned. The people from Food and Water Watch over here, Jessica, I think, and also Karina from, uh, from Canada are involved in this process, and I want to acknowledge them. And if you want to find out more about Blue October events, you can go over and talk with them as well. So let me conclude and finalize this by saying what you are doing here and what we will be doing in our workshops today is part of a building of a whole movement here in the northeast part of the U.S. Community by community, working on the issue that will be one of, if not the most critical issues of the 21st century. We are, we are on the cutting edge of this and we are building this process but we are a part of a larger movement. And that larger movement has many challenges that are in front of us right now. So welcome to the water justice movement. Welcome to the water justice movement here in the Northeast. Welcome to the global water justice movement. The resistance will continue. Thank you.